Hey students, I wanted to take time today to give you a brief introduction to our first lesson of our course, Making Friends and Making Them Count. Now this is one of the courses in our doctorate in ministry program as well as our doctorate in Christian counseling program. It deals with interpersonal relationships. In our first chapter, our first lesson that we discuss in this particular course is entitled The Rules of the Game Interpersonal Communication as a Process. And so as we look through our lesson material, we want to think in pictures. We want to let images be a reflection of the communication process. And so we're going to look at several images or illustrations that will depict different ways that we can look at communication. One of the ways we want to look at it firstly is communication as bowling. Now bowling is the number one participation sport in the United States. Although it doesn't have the glamour of tennis or the addictive quality of jogging, more people try to convert a 10 pin spare than work on their backhand or run a 5K race. Now in this model of communication as bowling, the bowler is the sender. He or she addresses the pins, the target or audience. He or she delivers the ball, which is the message. The message rolls down the lane, which is the channel for the message. Any clutter in the lane can deflect the ball. And when the message strikes the passive pins or audience, it has a certain predictable effect. So in this communication model, it places emphasis on smooth delivery of a message. The speaker or bowler must take care to select a precisely crafted message and practice diligently to deliver it in the same way every time. That makes sense if the target listeners are static pins uniformly set to receive the message. But oftentimes, life is not quite that simple. People aren't identical, interchangeable listeners to quietly waiting to be bowled over by our words. People come in all shapes and sizes and are devilishly unpredictable. In real life, the same message will have a different effect on different people at different times. So communication training that emphasizes the content of the message to the neglect of the other factors won't necessarily work. So in this instance, the bowling analogy also fails because the pins don't roll the back of the bowler. The ball doesn't roll back. In the days before there were automatic pin spotters, I somehow remember the pin boy having to retrieve the ball and bring it back to us. So communication is more than just a speaker's action. This realization has led some to propose an interactive model for communication, such as tennis or ping pong that come to mind. So let's take a look at these other two examples or picture images to take a look at what we feel interpersonal communication should be like. So we looked at the example of communication as bowling. Now in the second example, let's take a look at communication as ping pong. Now unlike bowling, ping pong can't be a solo game. It takes two to play. Now that fact alone makes it a better communication illustration. One party puts the conversation or ball in play. The other positions himself to receive it. It takes more communication and skill to fill the ball cleanly than it does to serve it. The speaker or server knows where the message is going. The listener or receiver doesn't. So, like a verbal message, 
The ball may appear straightforward, yet have a deceptive spin. The more knowledge the receiver has of the server's past performance and habits, the better he or she is able to anticipate how the ball will bounce. So we all know, based on this illustration, that ping pong is a back and forth game. Players switch roles continually. One moment, the person behind the paddle is the initiator. A second later, he is a reactor, gauging the effectiveness of his shot by the way the ball comes back. So in the repeated adjustment that is essential for good play is a close parallel to the feedback process in a good interpersonal communication. But even though that is true, there are still three flaws inherent in the table tennis or ping pong analogy which makes us it come short. Let's take a look at those. In the first place, ping pong is played in a controlled environment. The platform is stable. The bounce is true. The ball not deflected by the wind. Now in contrast, most face-to-face -face communication occurs in a storm of distraction. The second defect is that the game is played with one ball, which at any given time is headed in a single direction. That's like the game password where one player says a word then the other responds with another word. Back and forth they go in a ritualized, turn-taking fashion until communication is successful. Now, a true model of interpersonal encounter would have both people sending and receiving balls at the same time. The other problem is that ping pong is a competitive game. Someone wins, someone loses. In successful dialogue or intercommunications, interpersonal communications, both people win. There are no losers. So this is some of the flaws with the ping pong analogy as we found with the bowling analogy. Now let's take a look at a third analogy, which is communication as charades. Now I think the game of charades better captures the simultaneous and cooperative nature of interpersonal communication. A charade is neither an action like a strike in bowling nor an interaction like a point in ping pong. In charades, it is a transaction. Charades is a team game. While a team may be competing against other teams, the actual play is cooperative. For instance, for example, one member draws a slogan or a title from a batch of possibilities and then tries to depict it visually for team mates to come up with. The actor's job is to get at least one partner to say the exact word on the slip of paper. Of course, the actor is prohibited from talking out loud. Rather, he or she must show the actions or pantomime the images on the paper through their behavior and through their actions, they are not allowed to use any words. So for instance, suppose you drew on a piece of paper the saying, God helps those who help themselves. You might want to argue the theology of that statement, but that's not the point. Your goal is to get other people to come up with the mental pictures that will cause them to utter identical words. For God, you might try folding your hands or gazing upward and gazing upward. For helps, you could act out helping someone with the dishes or with changing a tire. Pointing out a number of imaginary people may elicit the response for them in the third word. At this stage in the game of charades, someone will fill in the gaps and shout out with glee God helps those who help themselves, and therefore your communication has been a success. So in inter interpersonal communication, 
Just like charades, it is an ongoing creative process of helping others build images in their minds. Communication between us begins when there is some overlap between two images, yours and mine. The more overlap, the more communication. But even when the images are congruent, chances are that communication is only partial. For each of us may ascribe different meanings to identical images. In the example we use, God helps them who helps themselves may be a comforting theological truth to some people but a cynical mockery to others. To one, a brown and white Saint Bernard may be man's best friend. To others, it could refer to a shedding, chewing, drooling, non-housebroken pet. You see, students, it's only when the emotional impact of the images match up that true communication occurs. Now this is a tall order. Sometimes a kind of mass click can take place within a group or within a subculture. Thousands of people watch the same home run at a stadium or the same scene in a movie and similar share similar reactions. But interpersonal relationships or interpersonal communication is different from that. The label interpersonal is appropriate only when the special meaning is shared by just two people. And that's why our definition speaks of a unique shared meaning that interpersonal communications is a private transaction. Now I'm going to conclude this lesson with 10 rules for interpersonal communication. There's going to be 10 little axioms that I'm going to give you, and you can make note of these. Just like in charade, we are intrigued by how the game illustrates certain principles. These 10 rules will introduce you to the content of each chapter of our textbook. So the first axiom or point we want to make with you, the first rule of interpersonal communication is that interpersonal communication is a process. Secondly, interpersonal communication starts with the self. Third, the chances for effective communication increase as people become aware of their motives for getting together. Four, people communicate to reduce uncertainty. Five, words don't mean things, people mean things. Six, you cannot not communicate. Seven, without identification, there is no communication. Nine, to reveal oneself openly and honestly takes the rawest kind of courage. And number 10, communication equals content plus relationship. So we're going to go over these 10 points in more detail as we go through this lesson. But in conclusion for your review of this particular lesson, we need to appreciate the personality of our relationship. That is, we must understand we. We must understand ourselves. We must understand the people we're communicating with. And we must understand the nature of our relationship with each other. Now there's a depiction in your study guide which shows one man sitting behind a big desk and another man sitting in a chair in front of his desk leaning forward. And the caption under the picture says, 
It is, it's not really all that important that we understand each other, just that you understand me. Now, of course, I hope that most of us realize that that's not the way interpersonal communication should happen. It must be a two-way street where interchange is taking place back and forward. So the idea of treating our bond as a living entity may sound a bit strange, so let me elaborate. When two people communicate, their relationship takes on a life of its own. Some writers call this relationship a spiritual child. A child springs inevitably from the interaction, but that doesn't mean it's automatically healthy. Its growth can be stunted by inattention and its well-being maimed by ignorance or abuse. On the other hand, the kid can be nurtured by high quality communication. That's what the last three chapters in our lesson will be about. They will deal with topics such as trust, transparency, accountability, forgiveness, and intimacy. The stuff of relational development. So making friends isn't easy. There's no guarantee that interpersonal communication will produce intimacy. But without quality, straight talk, Lasting closeness is impossible. So let me encourage you to plunge into the process of understanding yourself, the other person, and your relationship. It can be hard work, but I hope you have fun along the way. And our first lesson will start with the self. Today I've given you a quick overview of lesson one of the course, Making Friends and Making Them Count. We look forward to continuing on this journey through this lesson with you and may we each begin this process of healthy interpersonal communications.